Okay, you start and I'll come and sit down. All right, I'm back. We're all situated, sort of, mostly. Gustav is going to get a glass of water. <clears throat> He'll be right back. We're in his gallery. The work that you're seeing behind me is not his work, but I've got a bunch of his work oh, yeah, down no, here. Right behind, yeah, Wait, oh, this is yours? Everything. Everything. I take it back. I didn't know. I didn't know that he did these. Cool. All right. So, hello, first person. I feel like I just ran a marathon to get here. There's nothing like being in the car and, and knowing you have an appointment time and blowing past your appointment time and thinking that you're gonna art, outsmart your phone's navigation system only to figure out that your phone really knows what's happening and you know nothing. Apparently, we had a lot of rain in California and there's a lot, I'm in the desert right now, I'm in Palm Springs and there was a lot of rain last night and apparently a river flooded and it flooded some of the streets and that's why we couldn't get through. We kept trying to go down these streets. We thought we were gonna have a shortcut and there was no shortcut to be had. So, so it led us to going around the whole city, which made it interesting. Sandy, hi Sandy. Um, I'm so happy to see you. Oh, okay, so Gustav, Gustav? Gustav's uh, got a show in his gallery right now with his work. A woman named Anna Stump, who's going to be my guest next week. Ted Clark, who was my guest like a month ago. So, somebody named Daphne that I don't know that I'm excited to talk to because there is some really incredible, fun stuff here. And um, anytime that he wants to show back up for his interview, that would be great. Gustav! All right. Oh, oh, he wasn't. I I didn't know where he was. Now I know, and I'm not going to say. Hopefully, you can hear me okay, uh, because I also forgot my mics. They were left in my room. So, and it's my room is 45 minutes from here. So that's not going to help at all. So, oh my gosh. Hope you guys are all doing well. Here we go. Here he comes. Here comes the man. <laughs> and and uh, brought me some water. Topo Chico's. Thank you. Good. <clears throat> Hi. Sorry. Ah, uh, that's okay. I I'm got so, held up too, so it's wow. I know, we're, but we were both having the same experience trying to drive and get here. <laughs> Calling each other on the phone. No, don't turn here, don't turn there. Okay. Right. We breathe out. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for meeting me here, and I'm Thanks. so sorry that it was like nah. such an experience. Oh my god. Nah, it's good. It's good. We learn from our experiences. I didn't realize how long your hair was. I didn't either. I'm having a bad hair day. What? I'm having a bad hair day. That's not a bad I think hair it's the rain. Day. No. Oh, thank God. I don't. I actually don't get that caught on my hair. I just wanted it down today. It looks good. I like yeah, it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Cute. Thanks. Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Uh, first question, you already know since you've been watching interviews and apparently studying. I've been studying a little bit, so you ask the question, you have to ask. All right, the question is, tell me about what creativity looked for, look like for you as a kid. Mm, so creativity for me as a kid really started in the culinary arts. What? Yeah, I really? think it really started, I mean, I gave it a lot of thought. It kind of started in the culinary My parents had a restaurant in San Diego when I was a kid. Yeah. So my mom, you know, I'm from Sweden, so I'm born in Sweden. Raised in Sweden for the first four years, then moved to California when I was 10. That was 78. And so my mom worked as a manager for a French bistro called Pirettes, which is a famous, really uh, well-known establishment back in the 80s when the gastronomy of San Diego is really starting to, wow, you can have more than just, you know, meat and potatoes and, 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 and pasta. Right. So pizza. my mom, um, she had... She managed this restaurant and she really got into it and wanted to have her own place. So she opened up uh, Christina's Food Boutique in 1982 or 83 in San Diego, in La Mesa, uh, uh, East San Diego. And um, really was like, hey, it's Saturday, Sunday, we, we're going to be busy, you need to come in, you're going to wait tables, you're going to do dishes, or you're going to flip pancakes and make omelets all morning. So, so I was just like, okay, you know, you do, you do what you have to do for the family, right? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, but by this time you were already what? 
14. All right, but what happened before that? Uh, well, I mean, the, okay, were you well, just like an average kid? No, no, as a matter of fact, no, to be totally honest with you, I mean, I'm totally candid. I was, um, I was kind of scared as a kid. Yeah. Life was really overwhelming for me when I was young. I was the youngest of four, um, felt like high expectations were put on me. I wasn't that great at sports. I played soccer, I played baseball, and I never played basketball because I sucked at it. And then I played American football a little bit, and that scared the crap out of me because I was a little kid. And I never really found my rhythm until I started cooking with my mom. Do you, but you, but that was before when you were actually, before you were in California, right? No, this is weird. So this is California. This so is already California? Yeah. So it started, it started with the culinary arts. Then um, I discovered the skateboard. Oh. And the skateboard, um, much like art, um, it's you are, you're, it's liberating, but it's, um, it's a solo sport. I mean, obviously you can paint with other people, do collaborative works, this and that, but you, it's all you. Skateboarding is you. you. You're only competing against yourself. And that's where I felt liberated. Like, okay, this is skateboarding. And I was good at it. So, um, so going from the restaurant, I was also good at cooking. So it was always, I was always cooking. And I really found it fun because you're using, it's just like in, in, if, if you're painting, you're sculpting, you're using different mediums, right? Yeah. So whether you're using pasta, cold pasta, or hot pasta, or cold meats, or hot meats, or, or eggs, or whatever it is, you're, you can really, cooking, you can do whatever you want. Baking, another story. I'm a terrible oh, yeah. baker. Well, that's, that's baking is science. like measure, measure, measure. Well, it's like woodworking. Measure yeah. three times, cut once, right? Yeah. So, um, so really started with the foods and then segued into skateboarding. And with skateboarding, I started to, um, I built a little skateboard ramp out of a ping pong table that we had in our garage, right? Uh -huh. And once I built that little quarter pipe, classic early 80s, you know, piece of shit ramp, piece of shit skateboard. And they're like, whoa, look at me, I can do a front side turn. Like, I was like, backside's one thing, but doing a front side turn was like, whoa. Gustav can do a, he goes high on the ramp and then actually built a professional ramp or a professional, like a half pipe in yeah. my backyard. And so with skateboarding, a lot of it is you're, you're, you're drawing on your skateboard, you're tearing your grip tape to certain shapes and putting stickers on it, but I like to start painting my own skateboards. And so I started painting my own skateboards and painting my friend's skateboards and doing like designs. Just like, you know, with not even thinking about that, it's art. I mean, we've all paint, we all, use crayons as kids. So I mean, yeah. every kid's used crayons, right? So I think creativity comes at a very young age, but to actually harness the, the, the energy of, of art as you get older, especially like into a skateboard, that was pretty, pretty liberating. And then I started Wait, building, yeah? What, what kinds of things did you paint on? Um, I, abstract, um, I would do like, I would do a shape, and then next to that shape, I would use the contour of that shape to draw another shape. So it's kind of like a puzzle almost. Like, yeah. So you're, the, the contours of, of what you just drew uh, basically dictated what one side of the next shape you did. And then and you kind of just filled in the blanks, whether it's squigglies or sharp lines or shaded or paint it red or a, it just kind of came off the top of my head, right? And then, so segueing from that into building a skateboard ramp, now you're talking about woodworking. Like doing a transition, pulling a string, to get a nice eight foot transition uh, for, your, for, for your actual transition of the ramp. So I studied, okay, you wanna build a ramp, you don't want kinks in your ramp. You wanna right. be able to flow. It needs and, to be smooth. Yeah, so I learned from the ping pong, flat, 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 three flat spots, you know, that transition, you're like And then when I built that, um, I started to, I love working my hands and woodworking. And then as a kid, you know, I would work with bamboo and I made bamboo, um, Rose uh, vases, yeah, 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 uh, trashy bongs, uh -huh. and, and little pipes and stuff, and just well, we were kids, you know, so you just made your own you devices, just made stuff, yeah, anything that you could, get yeah, and that's so it's so so food to skateboarding to woodworking as you know for a medium in building skateboard ramps. Now, did you go to school at all for any woodworking stuff? I did. I did. So um, once I reached a mature age, I graduated from high school. I loved high school. A lot of people said they hated high school. I loved high school. I just thought that's where you bloomed. Yeah, it was just that's it was just I liked I liked school. I just liked school. Like I'm very I like to talk a lot. I like to be sociable. And and once I started, like I said when I was younger, I was really kind of afraid as a kid. But because I was probably because it's a big world. But once I started coming, you know, maturing, becoming of age, and started getting interested in girls and stuff like that, I was like, oh, okay, wait, I'm an adult now. I can I can do this. I can go out on my own and do my thing. I um. 
I had a bad relationship uh, my second year in college. I was actually engaged to get married, and things went south, and it's totally straight out of a movie. You can use your imagination. Um, and I decided, I decided um, to escape. People are like, well, you can't just like, run away from your problems. No, I wasn't running away from problems. I was running towards a solution. So I moved to Europe. So I moved oh, back wow. to Sweden. So, you know, I moved from Sweden when I was a kid. Never experienced Sweden, like, as an adult. Right. So I'm like, well, I'm going to go to Sweden for three years. That's four, three months. Turned into three years, which turned into 11 years. Oh, my gosh. So, and then when I was in Sweden, I worked as a chef. I skateboarded everywhere, traveled, all, and I was rock climbing a lot, too. Um, I really get into rock, into rock climbing. Once again, it's, it's, an, it's a solo, it's an individual sport. Yeah. Skateboarding, being an artist, chefing, it's, it's, you're, yeah, it's an individual it's, sport it's, kind it's, of yeah. thing, right? So I decided uh, to travel Europe once I was working in Sweden, but of course I worked in a Mexican restaurant, riding my skateboard all over the place, you know, chasing you were girls. You working in a Mexican restaurant in Sweden? Yep. Oh Called Tequila Bar. T-E-K-I-L-A. Now, what was the <clears throat> In Balma, Sweden, the southern part of Sweden. Now, I know, I mean, you've been in California. You've had Mexican food in California, which is some of the best yeah. outside of Mexico. Right. How well, as a chef, I, uh, you know, being a chef and cooking, you know, I, and I worked at a place called Carlos Murphy's in Grossmont Center. Maybe some of the people remember uh, Carlos Murphy's. It was an Irish-Mexican cafe. <laughs> but, you know, it's a big establishment. But I know what tacos and tostadas and quesadillas and fajitas and, and all this, these foods are. So... Going to Sweden, it was actually kind of Tex-Mex, uh -huh. but it was terrible. Like <laughs> queso, like melted. Yeah. Yeah. Melted no, 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 no. So I kind of redid the menu of this one restaurant, and I was really good at it, and it was really fun, and you know, the Swedes love to have a good time, and they love good food, so I, I kind of put my own California twist on the foods, and actually working in a restaurant was a great way to meet people, Yeah. to learn the language again. I mean, I could yeah. speak a little bit of Swedish, but not as good as I really wanted to. And, um, and then more importantly, like, you know, on Sundays, you know, we go out drinking and having fun on Saturdays. You're kind of hungover on Sundays. And then Sundays are like, okay, Sunday we're going to have a brunch, and then we're going to go to the museum. Or we're going to go to the park, or we're going to do something cultural. And that's just, and that's, Europeans do that. Yeah. Anybody that's been to Europe yeah. know that, you know, you do, you become, and so I met this one good, there's a good friend of mine's name, Sam, and Sam and I, we called ourselves cultural enthusiasts. Because that's actually what you're doing, you know, when you're young, you're 23, 24, gallivanting around Europe. And just really like, okay, I mean, you party and you do what do you, we all do. But me, I was like, I want to go to the museums. I want to see some art. I want to, and that was just, I felt natural to me. Because even as a kid visiting Sweden, I would go to Stockholm and we'd go to Milius Gordon. That's Carl Milius, who's this very famous Swedish sculptor. And these huge, light, larger than life sculptures. He'd man, I'm like, whoa. When you go see the Vasa ship, if anybody's been to Stockholm, you've seen the Vasa uh, boat that sank in the 1700s and they pulled it up out of the harbor and they made a huge museum. It's a fully preserved um, traditional Swedish warship. Oh, wow. Yeah, but they designed it terribly, so it was too heavy. It was three stories, cannons on the top, too heavy. A maiden voyage that sank in 20 minutes. In my head, I'm man mentally making this note, must visit Sweden. Yes. We have, oh, by the way, we're by the airport. We're near the airport, so there was a plane that just flew by. So sorry about the noise. <laughs> or not. Or not. <laughs> really. Or not. Um, but getting more into like why I became a professional artist, because I'm sure they're like, well, or I, what made me go from that to like, what? no, well, because it's an interesting I mean, story I mean, too. Why did you come back? That's what I wanted. Right. Go. I mean, well, you're okay. In for 11 All right. Years. Well, right. Why well, come well back? For, first, it's important. So, so I ended up moving from this one restaurant to another restaurant to another. So I worked in four or five different restaurants. Just most chefs, they kind of scoot around. Um, I was approached by a gentleman from Los Angeles, but was Swedish, to help him build um, a pool hall, restaurant pool hall. It's called Interpool, professional pool tables. And so I built a kitchen and worked with another chef and laid everything out. That's design. Right. You know, what, you know, I'm right. left-handed, so I want my, my griddles here and whatever. You, you, know, you, you work. Yeah, when you get you to work. design your own kitchen, then it's like, okay, little knowing that I'm designing, you know, yeah. it's an art form in itself. And um, I met this guy, and he made these really beautiful bar stools. They were made out of steel and wood, and they're really cool. And like, and and I messed around with wood. I was a tree trimmer in San Diego also as well, and would mess around like we'd fell trees, and I would use my chainsaw and like maybe cut slabs. And oh wow, look at this table! It's like a slab of wood. Okay, wait, stop. Let me stop you for a second. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to figure out stuff. So, when you said that you went to school. I was sort of assuming that you went to school in Sweden. I did. 
Oh, okay. And I'm getting to wrap that. So this, okay. guy, this guy that made these bar stools. Yeah. I was like, those are really cool. I, I want to do that. And he's like, oh, you're interested in this kind of stuff? I'm like, yeah, I'm really interested. And one of my ideas is to go back to school while I was in Sweden, not knowing what I wanted to do. And he said, there's a really great school here. Well, there's a vocational program you can take. I'm like, yeah. And so I remember, I didn't know much about social right. services. I didn't know how the systems worked. I was right. young, naive, kind of dumb. Not dumb, but just you know, right. uneducated in how things work. But you didn't also work. didn't live there. No. I mean, and so, but so. he pointed me in the right direction and said, there's a course you can take to do basic woodworking. And it's free. You pay nothing. And you can get a stipend for it. And I was like, what? what? <laughs> so wait, free school and free money to do the school. So I ended up taking these courses to learn woodworking. However, they also had a metals studio next to the woodworking studio. Yeah. And I wanted to do that too. So I had a counselor I went and saw and said, well, I want to do the metals courses too. He's like, well, you have to choose one or the other. And I'm like, why? No, I want to do both. He's like, well, we don't offer that. And I said, I'm doing both. I want, so he said, okay. I went back to see him and said, okay, well, I've spoken to my superiors. You need to come up with a good reason why you should do both courses. So I went and I wrote a letter and I said, we moved to America when we were kids. My parents put us through American educational system, but all four siblings, you know, my three siblings, so it was four kids, and all of us have been raised in America and done our four billion years. Think about how much money we've saved the state of Sweden or the country of Sweden, right? They call it a state though. Yeah. And they're like, they couldn't argue that. I'm all, my parents moved us to America and America has educated us. Now I'm back here. I want to educate myself in the Swedish system and this is what I want to do. And they were like, well, how, how are they going to argue that? So they didn't. So I, and I started with the metals course. I learned how to do welding, all the welding, MIG welding, TIG welding, stick welding, yeah. um, uh, uh, bending of, of, of steel. So you have what they call a break. So you put a piece of steel in it and you break it through like a bracket like that. You know? Yeah. And, and weld and everything I did, I turned into sculpture. So when you had to do, if you had to like weld, you had to do like a stick weld and you have to put a, to do a perfect weld, you know, it's the perfect burn through. Anybody who knows anything about metal working, you have to do the correct burn through. It's gotta be, you know, be able to hold the weight, whatever it's, you know, you know, industrial welding. Yeah. Then I did the, the woodworking courses. And that's just traditional Swedish woodworking. Everything from sharpening your tools to doing things by hand, doing yeah. dovetails by hand, say, so building boxes, sort of and Put then understanding, the, yeah, hand. and understanding, well, this is a table saw, and this is what this does. And this is a joiner, and that's what that does. And this is a planer. Yeah. And then the, the joinery systems, and this this is dug fir, this is maple, this is walnut. See, so really you very everything. basic. But I was like, the whole time, like, I was going to school full time, nine o'clock, wait, eight, no, like eight to nine in the morning till three in the afternoon, five days a week, getting paid, like getting paid. So I was like, my apartment was paid for, my my food was paid for, my I mean everything was paid for, and you're like. Being kind of an American, though being Swedish, but being grown in America, you're like, I mean, my brother, all my siblings took on stu uh, student debt, you know? So Why you're would like, you leave Sweden? <laughs> I'll get to that. Um, so I did that, and then once I completed those courses, I found out there was another school um, that was called um, Vinga Skolan, which means the School of Wings. And that they had a brand new woodworking um, brand new woodworking program that they were kind of beta testing. So I was one of the beta testers for this new curriculum that they were putting together. And that was advanced woodworking. And once again, fully paid stipend. I went for 14 months, 40 hours a week. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you this much, I was the first guy there in the morning and the last guy to leave in the afternoon. And my teachers were like, you're into this. I'm like, yeah, because I grew up in America. Like you don't have right, this in America. This, yeah. Vocational training and then professional training on top of vocational training doesn't exist so I, that's when I fully knew what I wanted to do I wanted to be a professional woodworker was that a program only offered to people of Swedish descent or or anybody that lived in Sweden anybody lived in Sweden so even if I just flew to Sweden maybe not right now I don't know if it's still available but I could just find you, this program. you could you have I mean you'd have to become a resident I mean I was a Swedish citizen yeah. even here in America I'm a green card holder I don't I'm not an American citizen um, but I would like to get my citizenship so I can vote which Get out and vote. Yeah, yeah. Um, All right. So that's kind of how that's how I became a woodworker. And then I'm going to answer the other question. So yeah. Why did you come back to America? Yeah. Right? Why would you come back? Opportunity. There's no opportunity. There's opportunity. Plenty of opportunity in Sweden, but in Sweden they kind of this thing like 
You're not supposed to stand out too much. You're oh. not supposed to talk too much. You're not supposed to... But then when you reach the top, then it's like, okay, then you're a superstar. So this is really weird. And plus the weather. I mean, it's like yeah. Sweden is cold. It's dark. Yeah. And um, I really felt that um, after... You know, I worked with different designers. Once I got out of school, I actually worked um, as a professor of woodworking for three years. I worked in a social program, and I taught political refugees how to do woodworking. That so kind of basing sense. them on my... Did they have that in their background? A lot of Muslim students, a lot of um, uh, coming from countries where people are oppressed and suppressed, and it just, you know, haven't had it good, you know? Right. And so teaching them so the fundamentals of giving back. If they had a woodworking background from their country, then they just need to learn, like, you know, Swedish terminology and, yeah. and Swedish tools. And another plane, sorry. Uh, but after that, I figured. Why not give it a go in um, Southern California? Then the weather, I miss my parents, I miss my family, I missed, I just thought it's like, okay, you just reach a point where you're like, I'm done. Yeah. You know, I think we all do, I don't yeah. know. I just reached a point where I'm done. And, and, and I mean, during that time, you didn't marry? Nope. And so there was nothing holding nope. you in No, and I, I mean, you know, my wife knows all this. You know, I'm oh. married now, I got married at 50, so I've only been married five years. But, I, hey, you know, you I, I, won, I wanted, I tried, I met, I had several Swedish girlfriends, and it just, you know, it just didn't work out. You know, it wasn't because it was bad. It was just like, all right. It this just, is life. Just, you know, it's not for, I guess, not for everybody. But uh, so I decided to move back to California. I'm like, I'm going to basically move back to California, and I'm going to open a studio and just, See what's the worst happens. thing going to happen? Nothing? Well, nothing. My, you can't, in my life, I can't say nothing's going to happen. Everything right. that I Everything do. Everything happens. Something happens. Everybody's got the opportunity to do what they want to do. And if you just kind of go for it a little bit, and just, you know, opportunity is abound, I think, you know. Yeah. You just have to be open to it. Ask the universe, you know, an opportunity. When opportunity knocks, open the door, you know. Yeah. I mean, everything leads somewhere. It's only when you don't want to go, you know. But mm -hmm. if you want to go, oof. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So then, so... What year was it when you came back? 99. 99. Or 2000. Almost 2000. So end of 99. So you were here for uh, the millennium changeover. That was fun. And, and yeah. <laughs> that I remember all. like it was yesterday. It was, we partied like it was 1999. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. When everything was supposed to stop. All the computers. The Y2K, right? Uh, yeah. All the computers were supposed to kill us and everything Right. Else. The Y2K, which didn't happen. But, yeah. It know. did not happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then you've been here. So did you come straight? Well, you went back to San Diego, right? Straight to San Diego. Okay. So that's where my parents live. And then you had a studio there. And then um, opened a really small studio in Natural City. Naturally shitty, we call it. It's like, it's part of San Diego. It's like South Bay. Which is, but I had a little studio and I had tools and I started um, doing interiors of boats. Oh. So I started on the nautical side. So how did you get your first customers? I mean, how, how did Man, you solicit I yourself? Mean, um, as a matter of fact, I started, well, uh, my brother was in Atlanta. I flew to Atlanta. We drove from Atlanta to San Diego. Within three days, we found somewhere to live. Within four days, I had a van, kind of like your van, old, <laughs> an old, um, and then a good friend of mine that worked in the plastics industry, um, uh, his, his boss had a good friend that had a cabinet shop. Just your run the mill, like high, high volume cabinets. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I had, I, I had to get a job right away. Right. I, mean, I, had, I didn't have much money. And it's not, it didn't concern me, and I wanted it to get straight to business. So within five days of arriving in San Diego, I was working in this cabinet shop, getting up four o'clock in the morning, oh and learning how to do cabinets because we didn't do like I didn't make cabinets like you know industrial cabinets. Right, you, know, you were making melamine one of with kind yeah pieces. melamine formicas and stuff. And but I was learning. I'm like, oh wow, this is formica. This is this is how you edge band. This is how you pre dowel. And this is so I already had the skills to do it. But I wasn't going to walk in and go, well, I've already been trained in Sweden. No, I can just, no, you just come in, try to be humble, and do a good job. Right. And I did that for like three weeks. And then the, the, my friend George, good, my good friend George Williams, who was working in plastics, he worked for his boss, and his boss had this plastic company, and he was going to build the uh, uh, interior of a boat. And he just asked me, he's like, do you think you could build the interior of a boat? And so I think when someone asks you a question that you go, oh shit, I, I don't know how to do that. Just say yes. And you say yes, I do. As a matter of fact, I just just say yes. Just yes. I don't believe in saying no. The only time I can say no is no problem. Right. I mean, just say yes and go for it. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But 
a challenge. I'm always, I mean, all artists are for a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Go no, for the I challenge. Look, challenge yourself. I look, I look, that's my philosophy, too. If somebody offers you something, say yes. Just say yes. Yeah. I mean, unless you were in, I mean, like, you've right. already booked yourself. Well, you know what? It, it's you know. interesting enough. So my wife Daphne and I were talking about it. It's like pricing your artwork or pr say you're going to bid out a job. Bid it to where you're going to make money off of it because you can always lower your price, but you can't raise it. Right. So start up here and then you can go, well, oh, that's, I can't afford that. Okay, then what can you afford? Or what, but don't say, well, I know, I, no, no, I'm not going to, you know, you, you have to be flexible in anything you do, I think. So when I said, yeah, I can do this interior boat, and then I just figured it out. You know, you just, stick. woodworking, okay, here's the difference between woodworking and painting. Yeah. Woodworking is very A, B, C, D, right. E, F, G. You really can't, you can't cut corners, you can't, right? You can't mix those Right, up. and then yeah. painting, so my paintings like here, they're kind of abstract stuff. Yeah. Well, that you can go A to, to D to, to F to, to B, to, yeah, to Q, Q, and you, yeah. you can jump around much more because I think painting is much more unforgiving, and what it, it turns out to what it is. It, but that's part of the beauty of painting, you know? Right. You look at Ted's paintings, like, I doubt he knew exactly what he was going to do. He just kind of goes along right. with it, and it starts to come, and then, okay, done, you know? Yeah. But woodworking, you can't just like, okay, I, oh, it's coming along. No, 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 no. No, it's Wood physical. Rigs of it, it's physical it's very and, precise, it's, you and know? it's like a puzzle. Yeah. The pieces have to fit together. Right. And it, plus it's dangerous. Yes. Woodworking is very dangerous. And playing music, you know, I mean, I got on my fingers. I don't have to tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yes. So that's kind of how it came to be. Um, open a studio and then I opened another studio. And so I've had four studios in San Diego. So the, uh, from once you built the boat, or the interior of the boat, were people all of a sudden coming to you and saying, I have something for you? Um, oh, I, built, I did the first boat. I actually quit when I was almost done. I got an argument with the owner, whatever. And then I quit. said, you know, he, I was spoken down to. And I'm like, wait a second. I'm busting my ass here to get this done. You don't talk to me that way. And he's like, da, da, da. I'm like, done. Took off my Motorola phone and gave it back to him. Done. I'm not going to put up this kind of behavior, you know? Like, I... I I'm doing a good job for you. And if you can't see the value of what I'm doing, I'm going to go somewhere else. And then he ended up calling me like six weeks later. Hey, so how are you doing? We're almost done. And, but there's some details that really need. Can you help me? Do, and I'm like, yes. And I was really humbled. And he didn't have to say I'm sorry. But he was like, we're almost done. And So he did call. He you. did call me back. And I finished the boat. And then, you know, it was up on a cradle. And then we got the whole to take it down to the, um, the marina and actually put it in the water. And you know, break a bottle of champagne on it. And it was that that was kind of a neat experience to see it. I never sailed on it though. Never actually went out. Um, well, you know. Uh, he didn't invite you. Uh, it's not that he didn't invite me. It just I never, you know, I, I never. So when it was underway, they call it right in the boat. I never actually was on that boat. However, I met another gentleman that was building another boat and built the full interior of his boat for like a year and a half. And um, I really didn't have all the tools I needed and he's like well you tell me what you need and I'll purchase the tools and we'll work on a deal when you're done well I finished the boat and I'm like hey this is great beautiful 1964 Chris Craft like 62 footer big boat wow, yeah. you know retro Chris Crafts are known for be beautiful mahogany, boats, well, mahogany and teak interiors and oh. it's all you know it's all curves yeah and perfect joinery you're using a lot of epoxies and yeah you, you know a lot of very intricate cuttings and and so you know there's nothing square so you're working basically. Right, everything's got a curve in it. Yeah, so, which is fun, but it's slow going. But I did that. And then when I finished the boat, I'm like, well, let's talk about the tools. He's like, you did a great job, you can have them. We're talking $20,000 worth of tools, oh like table gosh. saws and the other. And, um, and then I found a studio in North Park in San Diego. And it was a dilapidated building through referrals, because I'm going to go way over my time if I don't get to the point. Um, redid this house, lived in an apartment over the, my studio gallery built a studio and then this i had to prove to the city i wasn't going to do like industrial woodworking so my machine shop had to be a could only be a third of the size of my total space oh. so i had to map out here's all my tools and then the rest i'm like well i'm just gonna open a gallery so it's like i have all this wall space i'm gonna open a gallery and then so this was your first delving into gallery yeah and this space. is now now I'm in, now, now we're talking 2000 end of 2000 so now we're getting towards the end of 2000 early um uh, 2001 right so this what you have created here in this space is completely in your wheelhouse yeah totally yeah it's, this this is this was really easy for me and plus having I mean with with Ted and Anna 
Anna Stump, Ted Meyer, Anna Stump, and of course Daphne, who yeah, my wife. I mean, yeah. all four of us together, I was like, I have so much respect. I mean, Ted is an amazing artist, and um, him and I are completely polar opposite. And we, we kind of had a little rough go in the very beginning, but it's only because we're feeling each other out. And like, I just have major respect for Ted because he's overcome huge obstacles in his life, as you already know. And what he does is completely different from me, which is which compliments we compliment each other. Yeah. And plus, he's super funny. Yeah. I mean, he's got a sense of humor that I don't know. I can't touch, and a lot of other people I can't touch. He's just, he's just he's a lot more intellectual. Than I am. He's a little slower. He thinks things through a little more. But he's just really like mellow and very grounded. And then Absolutely. Anna is just an amazing artist. And since Anna is um, Daphne's partner, and I when I first met Daphne, Anna's like, "You better be nice, or I'll kill you." She didn't mean that, but she was like, be careful with Daphne. She's like, yeah, closest she meant, friends. She and something. yeah, and so when, that, when Daphne and I got married a little over five years ago, you know, Anna was there. She came to our wedding. We got married in Vegas um, because we kind of had to hurry up wedding um, because Daphne's mother was sick and we really oh. wanted to kind of move things along. So her mom, because she was battling cancer, so we could be, I could be part of that family, right? Um, but so I opened this gallery in 2000 then, so I'm jumping back now. Yes where it started yes. um an open gallery and there's other artists on this street it's called ray street in north park and uh, one of my good friends ken calloway had a frame shop on the very corner and he would frame all my artwork and other people's artwork and one day ken and i sat down and we're like we should start an art walk so we started an art walk we called it ray at night because we're on ray street mm -hmm. and the second saturday of every month we would host um art events and just to make a long story short um, I did 100 months in a row. Oh my God. Probably hosted over a thousand different artists. And um, it became the largest monthly art walk in San Diego's history. And we would have, uh, at the peak, we would have like 3,000 people. That's amazing. In an evening come through. I mean, we're talking wall to wall people. Okay. Full wall. And I would cook. And I was sponsored by Trimmer Pills. I was sponsored by Luigi's Pizza. Oh Luigi God. would give me like 15 pizzas. I'd have four cases of. Tumor Pills and other in the Bluefoot Bar, which is a beautiful bar. Adam, my good friend um, Adam, who opened the Bluefoot Bar, he would sponsor us with a keg sometimes. Adam Cook, Adam, um, and so we were. We've transformed. Not just me. Ken and I had the idea. We brought all these other. So little tiny street, Ray Street, like three hundred feet long, you know, and had like fifteen little studios, and all of us would be open, and people would. I'm not too my horn, but they would always come to my studio because I did crazy shit. I mean, so for example, right? Yeah. Um, I had right. bands play on my roof. <laughs> so I lived at the top, right? Yeah. I had bands play on my roof. Um, I had uh, David J from Bauhaus and Love and Rockets. Oh, yeah. Right? Come out and play with me. Musicians. Yes. And then um, I had Money Mark from the Beastie Boys. Oh, really? Come out and I played with him. Oh, my God. Never gosh. met the guy my whole life. He's all, play the drums, play the piano. Oh, yeah. He's all, okay, we're going to jam. And we announced it on like 91X, like, hey, everybody. Oh, we didn't, like, I called Halloran from 91X. 91X is a radio station. And, and yeah, Halloran's just deciphering. Right. And so Halloran's like, I don't know what you guys are doing, but rumor has it Money Mark is down at Planet Ruth. My, my last name is Ruth. Yeah. So I call my studio Planet Ruth. Yeah. Uh, Gustav is going to perform with Money Mark down at Planet Ruth. And within 15 minutes, there was like 300 people. <gasps> so, I mean, we did that kind of stuff. And someone told me recently, like, you know, you're like, you're kind of like the Andy Warhol of San Diego way back then. You just didn't think about it. Right. You There's just so much stuff. to do. There's so much to do. And on top of this, I'm doing woodworking the whole time too. So right. I just want to tell you guys, I mean, if you want to, some of you have always told me, you know, um, I don't know any other artists. I don't know anybody that's doing this. I don't know how to start. Hello? Hello? You just get a group of your friends together and start just making go. a big deal out of it. Just that's all. It. Every day, baby steps. Yeah. You know, and just so, so we kept doing it, doing it, and doing it, and then um, then I happened out, had an opportunity to take on um, a very large craftsman home in Bankers Hill in San Diego. So I moved my studio. I needed a larger studio. And the reason I needed a bigger studio because I started to produce the furniture that you're sitting on. Yeah. Which is barrel furniture. It's beautiful. Made yeah. out of wine barrels and discarded it's like wine the, and bourbon barrels. The picture that I posted of that of, mm -hmm. of that mm -hmm. chair. That's my and that's beautiful. a patented chair. I have a design patent on that chair. Wow. But a lot of people don't really care. So there's tons of people making it now. Yeah. A little bit of a victim of my own success, I guess you could say. Wow. Um, and I've sold this, this is a good one. I've sold probably close to 
two million dollars worth of barrel furniture. Wow. Nobody told me it was going to cost one point nine million dollars to do it. <laughs> right, right. I mean, that, that's so that's being an artist. Yeah. yeah, but it's even so. I'm proud of the work I've done. I've yeah. hundreds of pieces out there. They're all individually numbered, plaqued, my name, numbered, catalog, what year. You can see it on the plaques. I mean, you guys can't see it right now, but there's plaques. Here, should on. I pick one up? Here, I can show them right here. Show. Oh. We're going to show. I'm going to bring it closer. There you go. Closer, closer, so you can closer. see so. right there. And it's obviously going to be backwards, but this is, you know, it says Gustav Ruth, 2013, I believe it says right there. And this is Barstool number 26. Number right. And this is that's a, a wine barrel, a majorly sturdy piece of furniture. Oh, I'm sitting on it, and it feels really good, actually. And then, a, and then a bourbon barrel. It's a bourbon barrel chair, and same thing. But this is 2016. And it's number 37. But I have like I think I've done about 150 bar stools, 700 lounge chairs. This and you see my table there. So I mean, oh, just gonna... a lot of it. So catalog your work. Always catalog your work. That's a really good idea. Let's talk about some of these sculptural pieces, because. All right, so I posted a picture of one of the sculptural pieces that I bought in the Teeny Weenie Show. And this is, I'm gonna bring it closer. You couldn't probably tell from the picture that I posted online. My piece is just a little bit smaller than this, but this is a wood piece. Look how beautiful it is. <clears throat> it's totally like sculptural and modern. That's cherry. Just tell this us cherry about wood. All right, this is cherry wood, but I'm using non-ferrous metals. So this is brass, this is aluminum, and that's copper. And that's copper, brass, and aluminum. And that's a walnut plug. And just a hole. Just, just, but they're just a hole so and a, beautiful. And, um, and I've been experimenting, experimenting with non-ferrous metals now for... Have you thought about finishing all the sides? Because, I mean, they stand as pieces like this, too. Yeah, you can turn it however you want. But, but, but that particular, I put cork on it, yeah, so... But some of the other newer ones, you know, you can... And the back is signed and stamped. And no, then I just, yeah. it's signed. And I started making larger ones. You can see this is a little larger. Hold on. Hold on. So the, here's a bigger one in comparison to my hand size. And then using walnut and curly maple. And again, moving up the in exotic metals. woods, right? Then we start... And making even bigger ones. Oh, and this one's got a stand on it. So... So it doesn't fall over. It's, it's a lot bigger, you know? Yeah. So it's stable. Really beautiful. And then, and then they get even bigger. This is gorgeous, too. Look at this. A lot. There's right. a lot I'm gonna of weight bring it. Them. I'm going to bring it closer just so you can see, but now I'm going to bring it farther. And you can see in comparison to my head. <laughs> so this one, so this is cherry, and then you can flip it around, and this is maple, oh. and it's four layers thick. And it's got, you know, the brass, aluminum, and this is heavy, this one. I love it. say 15, 20 pounds? At least, yeah. Yeah. So my goal is to do that in like 10 foot. Like scale it way, way up. But that's... These are beautiful. Yeah. So I mean, this they, is a beautiful piece. So how did you come up with the idea for these pieces? <clears throat> because, I mean, now, now, I mean... They're all creative pieces, but these are these are no longer functional pieces. I can't no, sit on um, these. Sculpti or no, sculpt no, sculpting has kind of always been. I mean, like I like making functional art. So I mean, I just we I, we would have to sit for a week to tell you all the things. And then I like making like you know butter knives, like simple objects that anybody. So for example, right? So what are these? These are so these are eighty five dollars, right? And so I'm used to making like I mean I've done kitchens that are fifty thousand dollar kitchens, right? Right. And the reason why I kind of stopped doing larger projects is that it takes so long to get it done. Yeah. And it's not that I don't like doing it. It's just I kind of want to go where I haven't gone yet. And sculpting is one of the things I want to do. Yeah. Just to have, just look at a visual piece. And <clears throat> for example, when I met you up at the Teeny Weeny show, I noticed that you and David, you were looking at the different pieces and you were figuring out which one you like best. Yeah. Totally. So you're like, so now I, so I've always worked commission-wise. Like, call me, I'll make you something or draw it out and design it. Here I'm actually producing something and then I'm creating value. As you yeah. create value, create value, create tension, create value. That's how you become a successful artist. You want tension, like what, what how'd yeah. you do that? You know, right. what, curiosity. You want curiosity. Totally. And then, and then create value. And then obviously people are looking at my pizza going, which, and I saw David when he was looking at these now, he's figuring out which one he likes best. Which one do I want now? Yeah. And so you just kind of create something and, Push the boundaries of what you already know, and then like let let your imagination flow, 
But going back to what I was saying, it would take me like three months to do a $50,000 kitchen. Right. In a couple of days, I can make a small series of these. And for me, it's, it's the serotonin rush yeah. of finishing something going, yeah. I made that. Yeah. And when I was a kid, we all did, right? We're all kids. You go painting in kindergarten or whatever, or first, second grade. You go home, your parents go, look what I made. Look what I made. I think a lot of artists, they want, of course you want the attention. Well, Some of us probably don't want the attention as much as others. I mean, you can look at Ted, for example. Right. Ted's super humble. He's yeah. mellow. Cool. Right on. Me, I'm like, hey, look at me. Yeah. We're all different, but yeah. creating is, and also you're giving something that I don't think someone would ever throw this away. No. I think I want something to last okay. after I'm gone, which yeah. hopefully is not going to be for a long, long I mean, time. Should, if I like was in a thrift store and somebody like somebody's kids went into their parents' house and they found a bunch of art and they're like, I don't want it. Not that, you know, not that it's not worth right. something, but if somebody's put this in a thrift store, this would not last one second. Right. No. And that's, so that's kind of the thing. This would not last one second. And People if I like saw them, this, right? I would it's be so like, cute. oh my God, score. <laughs> score. Yeah. Right on. Well, I appreciate that. So that's kind of, you know, and then you can go, I don't know if you saw my, um, my door stop. A thrift store. So, a door stop. Oh my God. This it's is a thing a, of beauty. This is a door stop, right? And the story behind the door stop is I made these for the Frank Lloyd Wright Civic Center in Marin County. And um, I'm now an official artisan for the Frank Lloyd Wright Conservancy. Congratulations. Thank you. That's awesome. Very happy for that. Beautiful. But okay, but I want to talk about the design, the design aspects of this work. Because, I mean, you could have gone in any direction. I mean, but you chose a very modern, sculptural sort of feel. I mean, tell I'm me, Swedish. Is, is that, this is what it comes down is it to? Is simplicity? Simplicity. Um, how to take something very, create something very simple and make it beautiful. It's like, it's like, a, and I've done like square pieces. So you take, to take a square and create, make it interesting. How do you take a square and make it interesting? Well, put a round hole in it. <laughs> something so. <laughs> I mean, now it's a square with a hole in it. Right. And, and then stripes. you, then you can yeah. add stripes. Racing stripes are kind of my thing. So I call them oh. racing stripes. I wear the non-ferrous metal, right? So a non-ferrous metal does not contain steel. Right, steel is steel because um, of out. So these are alloys, and steel is steel because of iron ore. Mm -hmm. So there's no iron ore in aluminum or brass or copper, right? So they're non-ferrous metals, which means you can use you can use woodworking tools. Because they're they're bendable. Yeah, they're bendable, well, they're pliable. Soft. You have to still be careful. Yeah. I mean, you don't like you don't want to cut it quickly. You have to be careful about the speeds of your pan saw, table saw, what you're doing, sanding. Etc. I use a lot of files too because yeah. you can't sand that at the same rate as wood. So yeah. to get it smooth, you ha ha there's a trick behind it, right? Of course. And um, but I love using, I love using. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to segue into this. And I wasn't going to do this now, but tell I was, me. Uh, so I make jewelry too. Oh. Yeah. You make jewelry too. What? Yeah. Where is it? I don't know. Look around. Oh, behind me. I'm coming. <laughs> Here we go. All right. So here we go. Here's these pieces. So here we have the brass, the aluminum, and what was the third one? Copper. Copper. And he's they're stamped. This one says funky. So you're going to see it backwards. On the back it says art. This one says, this side says spiritual, and this side says Gustav 2023. And then the brass says deep. That's the copper. Oh, I'm sorry, copper. Deep and talk. So <laughs> these are, you know what? These are really, really um, masculine. masculine they're, they're, they kind of are. Yeah. They kind of are. I mean, I, I'm not saying right. a woman wouldn't wear them, but well, I mean, this well, is a woman, a woman has to wear them. So why? So the other day I asked um, Natalie to give me three words. <gasps> and so she gave, she told me spiritual, funky, and deep. So this is for me? This is for you. Oh, thank you. Oh my God, I'm so excited. <laughs> I was gonna, I, I wasn't gonna do it live. I don't wanna be that guy, but we were late and I wanted to give it to you before you got here. I'm anyway, so excited. I was, not trying what? to, it's not about me, you know? It's not about me. It's about, so it is, but it isn't. So producing like something of this, right? So I made these, I stopped making them a long time ago and I started again. Why would you And stop? I think they're, I don't know, you do other things, but I, so that's why I asked you. I thought, you know, you. so, you know, you guys, Natalie, she drove all the way from LA out to here, which is a two hour plus drive, probably, especially with all 
the traffic went through today. So I wanted, uh, that's my thank you to you. Thank you. You're welcome. And it, it, fits, it fits her, you guys. I, it fits her. Well, you know what I was going to say about it being a really masculine piece? And you didn't let me finish, but I was going to say, but it's not to say that a woman would right, wear this. Right, Because this... The, I think but it's I, just masculine in weight and, and mass. But it is to say that a man wouldn't necessarily wear a feminine piece, whereas right, as a woman right, doesn't right. wear You see, I don't wear, I'm not wearing... I wear my Thor's hammer, but... So I mean, but you know, the, and the best part is you can take one off. You can yeah. wear one. You can wear all both. But so, so like, like you guys, she told me funky, spiritual, and deep. I, I don't know if it was necessarily in that order. And then I threw my parts in there, which is art talk. And so it's kind of like spiritual art, spiritual talk, deep, spiritual, funky. They kind of all go together. And so, so um, that's my thank you to you. Thank you. It's so funny when I was looking at him, I was like, I looked at the word funky and I was like, oh, that's an interesting word. Yeah, didn't I say that recently? I wasn't <laughs> even thinking about it. That's a word I always use. But when you got to spiritual, I was like, oh, oh wait spiritual. a second. <laughs> so those are her words. And so if you, anybody out there is interested, you just give me some words and I will produce something for you and I'll let you know what it costs. And really, oh, I so just, I just like to make things that, you know, are really going to be around a lot. And I started making those one right before my, um. My mother-in-law passed away, oh. so I made her a little. I made my wife one that said "Brave," um, and it said "Brave" and something else. Daphne, I can't remember. Um, it said "Brave" and I "Love," or I, I, I really can't remember. And then I made another one that was with just aluminum and brass, and I made one for my wife too. That um, uh, well, I made one for Daphne, and I made one for my mother-in-law that said um, "Brave" and "Mom" and and just my name on it, whatever. And then actually, after she passed, I got that, so I wear that one. I'm not wearing it right now, but yeah, that's a whole, that's why we moved to Tennessee, which is a whole nother story. <laughs> We've been gone for five years. I know, and now you're we're back. We're back on the scene. We're back on the scene, and that's why we are in, um, that's why we are, we are in the desert. Everybody's moving from LA out here. You oh, know I know. That. I know. People are moving. Like, the pandemic really made people reevaluate what they're doing. I mean, it was bad. That's where we live in Knoxville. I was already living in the middle of nowhere. Like, I was already, like, um, um, well, quarantined in a way, basically socially quarantined because we moved to Tennessee to take care of Daffy's mother because her father like had... living there? Well, I liked it from the point of view that nature is beautiful there, and but, like, I really didn't fit in very no? well. No. Nah, for whatever reason, it just, I tried. Um, it's very click. So Knoxville is very small. So mm -hmm. if you come in as a new artist... I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm not knocking Knoxville at all. It's, it's a beautiful place. But for someone like me, I'm a, kind of a social butterfly. I'm a social, we all are. But I, I, you know, I, work, I met some other woodworkers and stuff. I work with them. And actually, a really good friend of mine, Daniel Duncan, is a fantastic woodworker. We're still great friends. And I've worked with him. And he's actually a little older than me. So he's mentored me and taught me things that I didn't know. All woodworkers teach each other tricks. Yeah. There's no secrets. And yeah. I think in the art world, don't think that you know everything uh, let someone teach you and, and build upon other people's experience to get you to where you want to be in your career and what you want to do and diversify what you you know that's why I like your your whole thing is like um, creative working different mediums what, what, what? yeah creative it, makers creative Artists makers can't stick to one medium. yeah I can't stick to one medium so you look at me I've it's food wood metal I've done acting, I've done Hollywood, I've been acting with Kristen Bell, I did Veronica Mars, I've done commercials, I've done, um, I make a barrel smoker. Oh, for, yeah, that's So awesome. Guy Fieri, Rachel Ray, they have my smokers. I was oh gonna, I was gonna work, we were trying to aim for working with um, the late, great Anthony Bourdain, oh. um, but I worked with all these great chefs out of Mexico and a barrel smoker. It's a barrel that's smoke comes like, what is that? You're like, it's a barrel smoker. They're like, you just, uh, where do you come up with these ideas? And I'm like, I just use my knowledge and go, how can I make this different? Just connect it. Just connect it and do something that, you know, just, and then watch people. Watch, so like you said, with the sculptures, I watch people looking, they're choosing which ones that are favorites. Like, I gotta keep doing this, you know? Yeah. And more importantly, you create inventory. Create that inventory, you know? And then we got paintings, so you go. Oh. I know. Hold I mean, on. Before we go any further, I see that there's stuff coming up here. So I'm coming over to read questions or oh just boy. comments and see what's happening. Oh, okay. So Sandy's watching. Hi, Carmen. Nice to see you again. Hi, Maya. Georgia says he's so inspiring. Thanks, dude. Carmen says, I'm here laughing because I always say yes when I'm alone and oh, Lord, help me. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> 
funny. Clifton says, going to try and sell two paintings tomorrow at the Detroit Fine Art Detroit. Breakfast, Breakfast What's Club. What's up, Detroit's in the house. Yeah, Clifton's always here. Carmen says, I know you'll sell them, Clifton. Oh, good. And uh, Carmen's talking about, I don't know what what was adorable. I think adorable. they came up with the sculptures. Yeah, she said that was adorable. I don't. I love the big one. I love the big one, too. Uh, Sandy says these are fun pieces. Carmen's just laughing. The energy is contagious. Love it. Thank Let's you. See. Ruben's, I try. Ruben's oh, Ruben, watching. what's up, dude? Thanks for watching, brother. Looks very nice on you, my necklace. The energy jingles are great. Oh, I love it. Yeah, Funny, it spiritual, noise. and deep. That's Natalie. Oh, yeah. that's Aww. so sweet. Thanks, Georgia. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm just figuring, I'm doing, we just met. So yeah, it's I know. like. So, okay. So tell me, okay. So, but now you're painting too. Yeah, painting. Um, so painting is, um, so owning a gallery and having hundreds of artists move through my studio, especially in the early 2000s, yeah. all the way through 2018 when I closed my studio to move to, to Knoxville, um, I've just learned from other artists and love to paint. I mean, paint is very, you, it's, 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 I'm not going to say it's easy, but I mean, I can drink a few beers and paint. You, you can't really can't drink a bunch of beers and do woodworking, which I've been known to do it, but you know, you got to be, yeah. woodworking is kind of, Dangerous. dangerous we know that right it's, it's sharp tools um there's a certain amount of freedom that comes with painting yeah that um and it kind of just comes from within and you can always say you're done whenever you're done um me that's why i, I paint abstract i don't do very much figurative but uh my paintings i learned from other artists so i mean i think it all started when i there's a there's a really great painter out there fantastic artist skateboarder his name is andy howell mm -hmm. and andy has been in the industry he's, he's really just an amazing artist all the way around. You look at his work and just go, I mean, it's just, he's trained and he knows what he's doing. He's got, and made, but he's, you know, he, he had, he started New Deal skateboards and did really well. He's done really, really well for himself. Really interesting guy. But he was like, he's paint. So I was never a graffiti painter. Right. But Andy was using spray paints in a non graffiti way. So I was like, Um, he introduced me to the aerosol can, and then I met other artists that were doing abstract work or more planes. I can close that. That's it, right? One more. This is a military, obviously. I was going to say, those are jets. Right. Anyway, so when I met him, um, he was going to do a show at the Cantor Gallery up in um, in L.A. or towards like um, that's more like like it's almost Hollywood. Oh, Cantor okay. Gallery was a really big high end gallery, mm -hmm. and uh, unfortunately, Dap, uh, Dap, uh, Andy's uh, father had passed away, um, and he asked me to collaborate with him, and I helped make this really beautiful sculpture out of plywood and paints. And um, it's a long story short. It's like actually it is. Uh, it's him and his sister and his father laying on a hospital bed, and I welded up all these pieces of metal, to, all twisted metal, and we cut out these uh, plywood pieces of different body parts, and then I put them all together in a certain way on these big frames, and we had two angels like coming up, looking down over this bed, and he painted all these paintings and painted out. It's hard to describe. It was really far out piece. I mean, Do you have any pictures of that? I have it somewhere. I'll have to send you one, but like, yeah, post it. Yeah. And, um, and it was just a really intense piece. And that's where I've, so Andy really kind of got me into painting and like, well, this he didn't teach me, but I watched him how to do right. it. So using Indian ink, crayon, Crayolas, uh, Sharpie pens, um, uh, Posca pens, um, you know, and obviously then I, then I started to segue into latex paints, go to Home Depot and buy like, Oops paints. Yeah. So you get gallons yeah. for nine bucks and yeah. smaller ones for three or four dollars. And just kind of like, you know, not going full bore like, you know, artist painter, but like cre creating these pieces. And then, so I just started creating these pieces. And then I've actually done. Here, I'm going to move this camera back a little bit so that we can get more of a view of you and your artwork. So I don't know if you, if you want to walk over to anything that you want to point yeah, out. Yeah, we'll go like this. That's Daphne's work over there. And you're gonna have to ask her later about her work. Yeah, I will. But so, like these pieces right here, these are mine, and they're on um, they're on um, they're on throw throw what do you call it? Um, painters tarps. So Home Depot, you get these painters tarps. That's all canvas. 
Oh, right? and you laid them on top? No, I, I stretched oh. them. They're stretched. You can see they're all, they're all stretched. So you stretched them on wood? Yeah, I make my own frames. I make all my own frames. I do everything. All well, the stretcher bars. And then the other four pieces, um, I collaborated with a gentleman named Phil, Philip Jordan. What's up, Philip? He'll see this at some point. And Philip is out of, um, he lives in um, Germany, but he's from Holland. And he's one of Holland's um, most prolific, I don't say prolific. He's one of, one of the best, I don't say graffiti artists. He's one of the better artists that come out of Holland. Wow. And he has this really interesting style. He has this, uh, so if you see the one up there, it's called, it's a teddy bear up there. See the teddy bear kind of peeking through. So he did a show in my gallery in 2008 in San Diego. It was called A Thousand Teddies. He painted 1,000 paintings and sent them over to San Diego. And we did the show. And then he recently visited me in San Diego and we collaborated. So I, I prepped all the canvases and we talked about what we wanted to do. And we did these paintings together. So they cool. definitely got a graffiti, a graffiti sort of feel to them. Right, they're those really, do. They're really very street. Yeah. They've got a street they, quality. Yeah, they, they, they kind of are. So that's what, um, that's what I've been doing, was doing with him. And, and I'm just going to keep, now that it's Daphne I and um, Ted and Anna, we're just going to, you know, keep pushing through and doing all these crazy. You might want to walk around the rest of the gallery and show. Well, I sort of, I sort of. Space, you know? it is, I'm just going to turn around the camera so that you can see. How it is a big space and you can see how much work is here and he's got it divided up by artists this this work by Anna and Daphne is just knocking me out honestly there's some really great stuff here so what I'm gonna just let's get it back mm -hmm. to us for a few minutes and then we'll close up here okay that's good enough um, so now now you're here what what are you seeing moving into the future? I mean, you're talking about doing bigger, right. bigger well, sculptural works. <clears throat> um, future, well, first of all, you know, Daphne and I still live in San Diego. Oh, right, but you're moving here. We just bought a house in a Rancho Mirage, which is like 15 minutes from here. Yeah. And so plan on having, number one, open hours, steady open hours, so people can plan to come and see our studio. Um, and then I'm going to continue doing my sculptures. I'm going to move my studio from San Diego to our home, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to move my Knoxville studio into an industrial area somewhere around here. You still have a Knoxville studio? Yeah. Wow. We still have a home in Knoxville as well. Oh, okay. So we live in Knoxville and San Diego, and then now we're going to leave San Diego. Unfortunately, bye San Diego. San Diego is a tough one, man. Okay. San Diego is a tough art scene. For lots of fun. I'm not knocking San Diego either, but the desert's where it's at. Yeah. So right any, yeah. any artists out there that are looking for something new, a big adventure or to go to quote Matt Gleason, the famous art critic and good friend of ours in Los Angeles. Like you got to go where the art scene is. And it used to be LA and people are moving out to the high desert, uh, 29 Palms where Anna and Ted have their beautiful home out there, uh, the high desert dairy. Um, and you have Joshua tree, Yucca Valley, and you have Palm Springs and, you know, Rancho Mirage and, it just keeps going. It's Indian Wells and then La Quinta. But it, out here, it's beautiful. It's wide open. And just the reception that we've received since we got here has been amazing. It's been, an, uh, uh, even for me, because I mean, I'm not even, a, I don't even have any art presence here, really. I mean, I just met a couple of people by accident. And now I'm, I'm like immersed in this, this like boiling pot of creative people yeah it's, it's happening incredible. yeah it's incredible yeah so we really just want to like we want to really be, very welcome of course i want to and then even in rancho mirage where we live the community that we're moving into is absolutely wonderful people are as a matter of fact i was at the clubhouse yesterday and they already want me to do some cabinetry work there and uh, they were talking about building a library but they want high-end beautiful shelving so it's kind of like you know you you really kind of yeah it's, you, you got to go to where the pulse is yeah. and and i guess it's just you know it's just the, the epidemic just push people out here. Yeah. You know, they're losing their spaces, losing their spaces in the, in, in, in the inner cities, and now they're moving out here. And so, and so I have to thank Anna and Ted for that because they're the ones that introduced us to Palm Springs yeah. and the area. And when we found this space, and of course really honored that they wanted us to you know, share it with them, it's a beautiful space. I mean, you only saw part of it when you turned the camera around. This right. is a, it's like 1,800 square foot yeah, it's space. Big. And, it's big. And we're going to have... You and your husband come out and, and play music with us. I love it. And we're going to bring bands out here, and we're going to serve food sometimes and do fun culinary events. And we have three great neighbors here, too. 
I saw that galleries I, down here and they're all really wonderful neighbors and and so it's kind of like going back to when I was on Ray Street you know you have this energy and you you feed off of one another and you all share your friends we had an opening the other night and and we didn't have a ton of people come but the people that come and are really wonderful and I met this other really great artist out of here his name is Denny Denny Gutter Doodles and you'll have to probably interview him one day but I met him uh, last year and we're partnering up doing work together and he's from New York so I mean, he left New York and came out here and this is opportunity this is this is you know knock 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 opportunities knocking yeah. open the door yeah. trains pulling in you do one of two things get on or you can sit the sidelines or you can be part of the game and so coach put me in you know and so we're gonna do wonderful art shows here and more importantly we're gonna bring something to Palm Springs and have Palm Springs give something to us and the whole Coachella Valley and to see where it goes what's the worst thing that can happen really I, <laughs> right? I, I, what's the worst thing that can happen nothing you're right nothing you're right nothing. not with all four of us I mean no between no Ted Daphne uh, Anna and I we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do great things and we just you know what I've said it before and I'll say it again you know life moves pretty fast you know stop look around once in a while you can miss it but also be the change you want to see in the world to quote Gandhi you know and I just really don't want to change the world I just kind of want to make it a little more beautiful yeah I'm with you that's it totally well with that being said I think that is a wonderful place to end make your world a little more beautiful that, and never way. give up and never live your up. dream here, let me yeah. just, let's see these, if there's any more questions, and then we will sign off. Laura's watching. Chris is watching. Let's see. Love the teddy bear. Somebody loves your teddy bear up there. And Clifton says, you need some Detroit out, <laughs> art out there. Well, cruise out. <laughs> Come see us. Come visit. You, I'll show you Clifton stuff cool. later. Yeah. yeah. Okay, you guys. Thank you so much for being here. I'm for the latecomers. I'm I'm sorry, and I'm sorry we were late this morning. Extenuating circumstances, but um, as always, I'm so happy that you came. It'll be in replay indefinitely for any of you that want to see it. And um, I also have a YouTube channel where I put up all this stuff so that you can show it to friends if you want to. Because some I know you, if your friends aren't in the group, they can't see it. Anyway, have a beautiful Sunday, and I will see you all next week. <laughs> Bye.